were just listening to The March of the Women by Ethel Smith, with the libretto by Cecily Hamilton, and The March of the Women was the anthem for the suffragist movement in Britain. It was sung at meetings, rallies, and in the streets. And I thought this was the perfect way to start off this week's class. So welcome everybody to Musical Herstory Week 3. I am Kendra Harder. Helping us on the tech side is Matthew Praxis. Once again, we must offer our huge thank you to Eric Pekow, Mark Turner, and the Saskatoon Symphony Orchestra for hosting this class. All right, so we are live streaming from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and we acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional territory of the Cree peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We pay our respect to our Cree and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. So we are talking about the suffrage movement today um, as a way to get into talking about Ethel Smith. Um, and, and suffrage isn't just something that happened in Britain. <laughs> it happened all over the, all over the globe. Um, and so just to give like some sort of little rundowns of other things that we're talking about besides the vote, um, there's, other, um, there's other things that feminists were, were working for and women were working towards. Um, you know, so like women who taught at a school only earned a quarter of what a male would make in the 19th century. Um, and a teacher was like one of the very few professions that was um, even acceptable for a literate woman. Um, if, if they were, if they got engaged or married, they were quite often fired from these posts. Um, and women were discouraged from public speaking and from expressing themselves through writing. So um, why would they teach them beyond the basic level? Like that just seems silly. Um, so like this is the stuff that they are, they're working towards fixing. Um, other things that um, came up, particularly in, in Britain, uh, there's the Married Women's Property Act of 1870 and 1882. So they're trying to have right for their property, um, also for um, custody of their children. Because um, as we saw last week, um, when Clara's parents split, um, her father got her by law. The mother didn't have any say in having the children. Um, so yeah, um, other things going on too globally at this time is even just like in general human rights. Um, we have the civil war happening in the United States. Um, and actually quite, I thought that I thought this was interesting. Um, both the civil war and world war one helped influence the public opinion about women and what they could do because they were helping out with the war efforts and filling in those positions when men were vacant. Um, so uh, just some fun little stats. Uh, so the right to, to vote was given to women uh, before the British suffrage movement was going on. So, um, or in full swing in the, in the 20th century, like pardon. Um, in 1881 on the Isle of Man, no less, um, the, the right to vote was given to women who owned property. In 1893, uh, the right was given in New Zealand to all women, so not just our property owners. Um, in uh, 1907 and 1913, in uh, Finland and Norway, respectively, women had full voting rights and they elected their first female members of parliament. And even in old Canada over here, uh, we had the right uh, federally in 1917 um, and then provincially it was just different. Um, also of note, just because I mean, I'm, I'm a Canadian, so it's, it's things that I look into. Um, so Indigenous Canadians were given the right to vote in 1870, 1867 at Confederation, but if they did that, they gave up their treaty rights and their Indian status. Um, so then they weren't actually given like a a real legit um, uh, um, ability to vote until 1960. Um, so we, we still have lots of, there's always been lots of work to do. Anyway, I am now going to hop across the pond to Britain because that's where we're uh, setting the stage for Miss Ethel Smith or Dame Ethel, Ethel Smith. Um, so in 1865, the Society for the Promotion of Women's Suffrage was formed in Manchester. And in 1903, 
we meet Emmeline Pankhurst, who was, and her daughters, Christabel and Sylvia, who established the Women's Social and Political Union. Um, so the WSPU, they um, eventually embarked on militant crusades to help secure the, the vote for, for British women. Um, and the reason it had to get, I guess, more in your face and with some um, property destruction and, and those types of things was because they wanted to be heard. Um, they kept bringing it up to parliament members and saying like, are you talking about the vote for women this time? Are you going to bring this up? And they kept ignoring them. They said, oh yeah, yeah, we'll do it. And they never did. So they needed to speak louder so that they would be listened to. And so by 1910, this had sort of reached kind of a feverish pitch. Um, you know, the, the suffragists were imprisoned, there were hunger strikes um, and then forcible feedings. And so in the same year, um, Ethel Smith was called upon for her support to the cause by Lady Constance Lytton. Um, since Smith was um, an independent professional woman, she very much, she naturally reflected these aims of the suffragists. And so she joined the fight. And so from 1910 to 1912, Ethel devoted herself exclusively to women's suffrage. Um, so she didn't do any composing besides um, like the, the anthem we heard. And I think there was two other songs, but otherwise, yeah, she was very much involved and devoted to the cause. Um, and I love this little quote. While women in many countries were continuing to knock on doors, some women, like Smith, tended to batter rather than knock. So a part of the civil dis disobedience and militant things, um, this is where Ethel was arrested. So about her imprisonment, Ethel wrote, it was impossible to keep my self-respect without throwing in my lot with my colleagues in the union so she threw a brick through a window of the house of the cabinet minister, Lewis Harcourt. Ethel selected this minister for correction because he had told a suffrage deputation he would agree to the vote for women if all women were as well behaved and intelligent as his wife. So for this act, Ethel served two months in Holloway prison in 1912. And while in prison, love this story, she conducted her fellow inmates in a chorus of March of the Women through her cell with a toothbrush. <laughs> and so there, there's another action. I'm pretty sure she was a part of this. Um, so uh, this here, this lovely book, mm, smells good. Uh, this is uh, Sylvia Pankhurst's um, recollection of the suffrage movement. Um, so daughter of Emmeline Pankhurst. And there were, they were kind of looking to arson as another way to, um, to um, get looked at, to, to get attention, um, like in a good way, not a needy way. Um, so for this reading, it's, it's much funner to more, it's more fun to read because with English writers, they're always so, um, they're so smart with their words and their language. Um, and so in here, the, the difference that we're seeing is Smith spelled with a Y and Smith spelt with an I. So for the sake of this reading, when it says Smith with a Y, I'm going to say Smythe. And when it's Smith with an I, I'm going to say Smith. All right. The first attempt at serious arson was that to set fire to Newnham House, the resident of the anti-suffragist minister, Lewis Harcourt, ring any bells. On July 12th, two militants with cases of inflammable oil, picklocks and glass cutters, hired a canoe at Abingdon. One of the two, Helen Craigs, who did all the talking at every stage, referred to the other as Miss Smythe, but insisted that the boatkeeper should book the name as Smith. At 1 a.m. next morning, a policeman discovered the women crouching among the ivy by the wall of Newnham House. Helen Craigs says they were camping out and had come to look around the house as it was too hot to sleep. Her embarrassment being obvious, he ordered both women to accompany him to the police station. They attempted to run away. Helen Craigs was captured, but her silent companion, who was traced as having appeared in the neighborhood as Miss Smith, escaped across the fields. The bookkeeper was positive the name Smythe had been mentioned. A vocal card for Dr. Ethel Smythe's March of the Women was found in a book amongst the luggage in the canoe. 
Dr. Smythe, she had a University of Denham. Okay, Dr. Smythe had been arrested for breaking the windows of Harcourt's house in March. So the story I just told. What more likely than she had pursued her vendetta by attacking his country residence? So she was arrested at Hook Heath, that's her home, and brought to Oxford for identification. She was able to, prov to prove a complete alibi. Moreover, the witness obstinately refused to identify her. That was a silent woman. But this, indeed, she was very voluble, very indignant. She wrote to the press in high disdain, ridiculing the police for their folly. The alteration of a single vowel in one's name seemed to her one of the less happy devices for securing anonymity. Had she desired that, she might have called herself Brown, Jones, Robinson, certainly not Miss Smith. Yet if only the police had looked but a little further along the same line, they would have discovered the missing culprit for her name, actual fact, was Smythe. So as we can see, she is a very, very spirited lady. Um, and it's also very fun to note that she was 50 when she did this. Like, it's not like she's in her 20s. No, she's 50 and she is doing this. Um, so now that we are going to start talking about Ethel Smith as composer, I would like to start with a beautiful little anecdote. Brahms believed everyone resembled a musical instrument. He thought of Smith as an oboe. So perfect. <laughs> so Ethel Mary Smith was born April 23rd, 1858. She is one of eight children. Her father was a major general in the British army. Her mother was distantly related to a baronet. They weren't aristocratic, but they were an upper, upper middle class family. General Smith believed his daughters would behave in an acceptable fashion. As a woman born in Victorian England, Ethel was expected to exhibit manners deemed proper by the rigid rules of English society. She was educated in the genteel arts, including how to darn stockings, all in hopes to eventually make a suitable marriage. <laughs> this sounds like the exact opposite of Ethel Smith. <laughs> in 1876, she decided that she must go to the Leipzig Conservatory to study comp position. She wanted serious study. When her father learned that Ethel wanted to be a composer, he said that he would sooner she were under the sod, but her mother quietly supported her. So in 1877, after months of tension, General Smith begrudgingly allowed his daughter to travel to Leipzig with her brother-in-law, Harry Davidson. Um, Sylvia Pankhurst, in her, in her book here, she actually says that Ethel ran away from home to study music, <laughs> which also seems very likely, but uh, there's a little bit more information here on uh, Dr. or sorry, General Smith's uh, stipulations. So part of his terms of Ethel going to study music in, in Leipzig was that um, he would know the family she would live with, that she would live within her monthly allowance, and that she would return home every summer for vacation. Hmm. Yeah. So off to Leipzig. There, Ethel Smith took composition with Karl Reinick, counterpoint and general, general theory with Sal Solomon Yedison, and piano with Joseph Moss. Ethel says, the lessons with Reinick were rather a farce. Yedison's classes were at least amusing, but equally farcical as instruction. Mass was a con conscientious but dull teacher. Ethel sort of realized while she was there that the majority of the students were there to get teacher's certificates and not study serious music. So after one year, she quit the conservatory in disgust. And then she took up private music lessons with Austrian composer Heinrich von Herzog Herzogenberg. <laughs> um, who was a close friend of Brahms. So through these two, um, Ethel gained access into the musical circles of Brahms and Clara Schumann. Um, while she was at the conservatory, she also met Grieg, Dvorak, Tchaikovsky, who were all students at the conservatory. 
Um, so in 1878, so she's composing, she's learning, um, and actually studying orchestration on her own, she got a um, the Hector Berlioz treatise on orchestration, and she was teaching herself orchestration from that. Um, anyway, 1878, she takes her German leader to Breitkopf in Hartel, which was music publishers there. Um, the, the gentleman who did the business dealings, Dr. Haas, he told Ethel no composeress had ever succeeded in publishing and selling her works, except Frau Schumann and Fräulein Mendelssohn, whose works were published with their husband and brother, respectively. Uh, he also mentioned uh, Miss Lang, but nothing had sold. So then Smith played him her songs, and then he very willingly agreed to take the risk. She was very excited about this, but she was also very taken aback by everything that he said about women. So she forgot to ask for a fee. <laughs> In her memoir, she writes with this, did you ever hear of such a donkey? <laughs> I love her. <laughs> um, Ethel remained in Europe for 10 years, um, occasionally visiting home. Not every summer, occasionally. <laughs> so um, inside of Ethel's story, we, we get to see a little bit of how um, those two pieces of the um, pieces necessary for people to compose of time and encouragement help her to create more pieces of music. So by having the time and education naturally to compose. Um, she wrote some orchestral pieces and her four, her four movement first orchestral piece was called Serenade and it was uh, performed in Britain. And the press was surprised to discover that E.M. Smith was a woman. The critics were very impressed with her strength and craftsmanship and they praised her work in masculine terms. So virile, masterly in construction and workmanship. And devoid of the qualities that are usually associated with feminine productions. Nonetheless, like it was very well received. And so she went on to write her mass in D, which is a huge, amazing piece. We are going to listen to it. Um, I'm gonna skip over it just so I can talk for just a little bit about opera because the mass in D did so well that uh, there was a German conductor named Hermann Levi who she showed the score to and after seeing it, he said, you need to try writing opera. So she did. Um, and this is like a huge, like a huge accomplishment for a woman because there's that whole idea that women can't write opera. They can't write the larger forms. And it was like pretty much a man's world and the opera kind of still is a man's world even today. Um, but she, so she, she got herself in, she in over her lifetime, she wrote six operas. Um, but there's kind of like a little tiny extra hurdle for her because um, in England, there was a bit of a, a prejudice against English speaking opera. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why, but they didn't like it. They thought English opera was just, no, no, don't want it. They liked operettas such as like Gilbert and Sullivan, Pirates of Pen Penzance, that kind of thing. Um, and that in the summertime, but nothing beyond that. So Smith's first operas were in other languages and they premiered actually um, on the continent. Um, her, her second opera though, Der Wald, that one did um, very well. Um, so it had like its German premieres um, and this is huge. It was premiered at the Metropolitan Opera in 1903. And that was the first opera by a woman perform, performed by the Met. And it's like a hundred years later till they do another one, but Ethel did it, Ethel did it. Um, so with um, the first operas that Ethel writ wrote, um, she worked with a librettist named Henry Brewster and they were very good friends, very close friends. Uh, and so he was also the librettist for what she considers her finest work, The Wreckers. Um, it premiered first in Germany and, and it was in German, <laughs> um, but she, after I think two performances, she had it translated into English, well, she translated it into English. And then it had a fully staged performance conducted by Sir Thomas Beecham in 1909. So this one did very well too. Um, I, because we don't have a lot of time, I did include the orchestral prelude to act two on the cliffs of Cornwall. Um, and in it, you kind of hear the, the sea and it, it sounds very British like this, opera is a British piece in a sense because like more than the other German operas because it's it's a German um, story or it's an English story sorry guys it's an English story 
um, taking place in Cornwall, obviously. Um, and, I, and I actually couldn't really find a full recording. Otherwise, I probably would have just talked opera on that. Now I'm going to go backwards to the Mass in D. Um, and this is huge. Like, this is her first major success. It premiered at London's Albert Hall in 1893. Um, it illustrated her dramatic abilities and her skill with handling large scale forms. Um, there's a British musicologist, Donald Tovey, who liked it so much, he actually put it in his essays in a music analysis. And it was among the choral works of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms. And he even went so far as to compare it to Beethoven's Misa Solemnis. This is a great piece and actually I love it. Um, it's an hour long, so you definitely want to carve out a good chunk of time for yourself to listen to it. Um, and what's also interesting is that it can be performed in the standard mass format, but how it is on the recording I've, I've put here is how she preferred it to be done, which is it's a little bit out of order actually. And what really struck me was that at the very end, she had the Gloria. And my experience with the Gloria was that it was its own mass, but she just added one to her mass, like in addition to all of the others, like the Credo, the Kyrie, and then she has the Gloria at the end, um, but it's fantastic. So I'm going to play the last five minutes of it because it is, it is phenomenal. Um, let's just get this here. All right, share. And the nice thing is um, when we get to YouTube stuff, now there's uh, five minutes, it's so epic. Um, yeah, it's so good.
That is such a good piece. Love it. Uh, okay. That's going to stop there. All right. But we've run out of time. So we are going to switch straight to Fl Florence Beatrice Price. And actually, we're going to go to 2009 for a little bit. Stay with me. So it's 2009, and a couple has just bought a house in Illinois. But before they move in, some vandals broke in. They stole a piano, and they threw a whole bunch of paper everywhere, made a huge mess. So the couple moves in, and they're cleaning up the papers. And as they're cleaning up the papers, they see that there is a particular name written on a lot of the different pieces of paper. It's sheet music. Florence Price. So they Google it. Turns out she's an American composer. She was a really good American composer. So this couple in 2009 found a whole bunch of scores that were thought to be lost. Like that is amazing. So they donated all of them to the University of Arkansas. And one of those, I am going to play a little bit for you. This is the Violin Concerto number two, the lost work, and I need to share my screen. Totally zoned out there because I was enjoying the music. <laughs> I was going to pause there. So we can actually start talking about Florence Price. So who was Florence Price? Well, very importantly, she was the first African-American woman to be recognized as a symphonic composer. Big words again for the composer thing, symphonic composer, because that is, again, another one of those areas that was cut off to women, right? The big works. So Florence Price was born in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1887. This community was a racially integrated community, and so it was a good place for the family at the time. Um, she was from a middle-class African-American family. Her father was a dentist, Dr. James H. Smith. He was the city's only Black dentist, but he had lots of clientele. He even served the state's governor. Work, Dr. Smith. Her mother was Florence Irene Smith and Florence the senior was a music teacher. She was a soprano and concert pianist and she gave Florence her first music lessons. Additionally, Florence the senior, um, once she married, she also had a restaurant, sold real estate and was a secretary at a loan company. Like that is quite the resume for a woman in 1880s. So Florence, I guess junior, <laughs> I don't think that's right. But Florence has, she's got this um, really good upbringing for her. And um, she's quite smart and bright and intelligent. Um, at the age of four, Florence played her first piano recital. She had her first composition published at age 11. Does this sound like the bright young Schumann? Yes. I mean, different, 
people, different continents, don't mind me. Um, Little Rock was also home to another very well-known composer, William Grant Still. He was the first African-American to conduct a professional symphony orchestra. Yes. Um, and so uh, William and Florence, they would have grown up together. They would have lived just a couple of blocks down from each other. Um, and they even had some of the same teachers. So very exciting. So um, Florence, she graduated from high school at age 14 and she was the valedictorian. Um, this was a segregated high school, which is important to note. So even though Little Rock is more accepting, there's still those undertoes of racism that um, Florence and her family and William, of course, they are, they are living through and um, that's there. Um, but anyway, since she graduated from high school at age 14, she was a little young to keep doing her education. So she took a year off. But then in 1904, she went to the New England Conservatory in Boston. Um, she was one of two or three black students that were there. Um, and she was one of the top students. Um, she got two degrees, which was actually really unusual at the time. Like most people just got one, but she got two. She got one in organ performance and she got a teaching certificate. Um, she studied with Wallace Goodrich and Frederick Converse and she took private lessons with the director of the conservatory, George Whitefield Chadwick. And Chadwick did not often take students. Like it was quite rare that he took private students and he took um, Florence on. So she was, yeah, she was a very good musician, very good composer. And so, um, yeah, she, yeah, yes. So after, after she graduated from New England, she taught for one year at a school. Um, so it's the campus called Cotton Plant Arkadelphia. Um, I'm not quite certain if this was a segregated school or if it was what was called a historically black college and university. Um, and I think like the difference is quite, this is my um, guess, that's a little bit minor. So like the segregated schools, that's the only place that the, that African Americans could go to school um, and, the, and, and white people didn't go there. Where I think with these HBCUs, like I, my mouth, <laughs> it's got an acronym. Um, they, they, were, they were made so that African Americans had a place to go to school, but it's not like it was exclusive. Um, I think that's the difference. Um, and actually very important to that. So these HBCUs, so they came in um, in 1890, Congress passed what was called the Second Moral Act and like moral, like R-R-I-L-L. -L. Um, and it required the states to establish a separate land grant college for African-Americans if those, if their other land grant schools were not um, admitting them to their schools because there was a lot of discrimination. Um, There's lots of schools that they did not allow African-Americans at all, or they limited the enrollment um, by putting quotas so that they didn't have to get, take on too many. Um, so anyway, I'm not sure if this, this first school that she was teaching at was an HBCU or a segregated school. Um, nonetheless, she taught there. And then after that, she taught at Little Rock's Shorter College, so back home at a college there. Um, and so while she was teaching at Shorter College, her father died and that was in 1910. So her mother sold the family home where Florence would have been living and her mother moved back to Indianapolis. So from there, Florence went to Atlanta and she taught at Clark College. Now Clark College was an HBCU and it was the nation's, like America's first um, graduate institute to award degrees to African-Americans. And so this is where she taught for a bit. Um, but after teaching there, she moved back to Little Rock um, and she taught music privately and became active in composition. Um, and the reason she was teaching privately because she was not able to find employment. Um, she was refused admission to what was the Arkansas Music Teachers Association. So she just founded the Little, Rock, the Little Rock Club of Musicians and taught music at the segregated schools. Um, so at both, and this is, at, this is a backwards note, sorry guys, my notes are out of order. <laughs> at both Shorter and Clark Colleges, she was very involved in help building um, like culture for everybody and um, encouraging her students to create and to write. She had one student um, who was a poet. And so she sent that student's um, poem to Webb Dubois, 
who later published it um, on his student's behalf. So very involved, very encouraging, wonderful person. Um, anyway, back to Little Rock where she's teaching out of her home. And she was quite dissatisfied with the music that was available for younger children. So she started writing her own piano pieces. Um, so she had those published as well. And then she also published um, higher level piano pieces. So in 1912, she also got married to attorney Thomas J. Price. And so this is her little, her, uh, what's going on for her in 1912. So now, um, so sort of from like 1890 kind of to then, um, the race relations in Little Rock were deteriorating. And actually, I feel like that's kind of an understatement of the year deteriorating is, yeah. Um, so what you're starting to see a lot of is these Jim Crow laws. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, this was a collection of state and local statues that legalized racial segregation. Um, these were meant to marginalize the African-Americans. Um, it denied them rights to vote, to hold jobs, to get education. Um, so a few that we see in Arkansas is there's the separate coach act and this required um, there to be separate train coaches for African-Americans or um, there was in 1903 um, they had to there was separation of the races on the urban streets so you couldn't even walk on the same side of the street um, and in 1890 um, Jefferson Davis was elected as governor because of his anti-negro platform. So because of all of this starting to happen, all of this um, growing racism in, in Little Rock, Price's father lost all of his white patients. Um, so as a result, a lot of, um, so he, only, he had a much like smaller clientele, not to mention um, they were poorer. And so sometimes he would just give his services out for free because he's not gonna not treat their teeth. Like, come on. Um, also, Florence's husband lost a lot of clients at the law firm, um, and he was getting quite angry and quite frustrated, naturally. Um, so all of this kind of starts culminating. And in 1927, there was a very gruesome lynching in, in Little Rock. And so as a result, the prices, they left. They got out of there. It wasn't safe. They needed to go. So they went to Chicago. And... Um, with the frustration and anger that Thomas Price was feeling, he started getting abusive. And so in 1928, Florence left him. She got out of that. Um, and so she was granted divorce. Um, so she's doing a little, uh, she's having some hard times, but despite all of this, she keeps composing. She keeps taking care of her children. She keeps finding students. Um, they were very, they, they, they had some very fortunate friends. Um, so in Chicago, there was a woman named Estelle Bonds, and she took in Florence and her children, and they lived there. Um, also living with Estelle Bonds was her daughter, <laughs> naturally, um, but her name was Margaret Bonds, and um, she is a, a famous pianist and composer, and who taught her composition, but Miss Florence Price. Um, so this, this home is a, it's a good place, it's a good landing place. Um, also, it was this gathering place for many musicians and intellectuals and artists. And these are people who are associated with what's called the Black Chicago Renaissance. Um, in a lot of resources, I saw them saying that Florence was involved with the Harlem Renaissance. But I'm thinking, well, that's New York and she's in Chicago. And when I saw the Chicago thing, I was like, that sounds more accurate. But I, I want to just touch a little bit on the Harlem Renaissance because it's actually a very important um, aspect in African-American music. Um, so this is, and also Harlem and Chicago both, the reason we saw this huge influx in this um, creativity was there was this great migration that happened where African-Americans were coming north in, in the States. Um, a, a huge reason was because of the racism in the South and kind of being pushed out. Um, However, there was also like the First World War, there was the depression. And so people are needing to find work. They're um, struggling to find jobs. And so the North was kind of a better place for that. So both of these centers had um, these huge influx of these African-American communities. So there's Harlem in New York, which is um, infamous. And more people know about the Harlem Renaissance and the Black Chicago Renaissance. Um, and so that took place in the 1910s to 1930s. Um, and so this was like a golden age for, for art. 
um, it gave African Americans pride and control over how the Black experience was represented in American culture. And it also set the stage for the civil rights movement that happened in the 1960s. Um, so then in Chicago, that happened in the 1930s, 1940s. And so to me, it makes more sense that um, Florence and Margaret as well were involved with the uh, Black Chicago Renaissance. There's my tangent, back to Florence. So she's in Chicago. She actually gets herself some more education. She studies at the American Conservatory and the Chicago Musical College. And actually there's, there's a fair list of, of schools that's listed there. Um, so, so how Price, her compositional style was she married together what was the romantic nationalist style in America which was this fairly programmatic idiom with um, kind of that same functional tonality that we see in the Romantic era. So not the crazy Schoenberg atonality stuff that um, starts happening after 1935. Um, and then also has colorful or orchestration. So she has that, but then she's also marrying it with black folk music. And she's putting all of those things together and she's got a really cool musical style. Um, so in 1933, she writes her symphony in E minor. This is her first symphony. And she won the Wanamaker Award for it. I don't think I'm saying that right. Anyway, she won first prize in the symphonic category with her symphony. She also won first prize in the piano composition category with her piano sonata. And the other prize was won by her student, Margaret Bonds. So we just can see how amazing she is at things that she's producing. Um, it's it's well, well received. And so the conductor of the Chicago Symphony at the time, Frederick Stock, he was really impressed with Florence's work. And he even championed her to, to write more works. And so she wrote a piano concerto that was played by Margaret Bonds in 1934 with the Chicago Women's Symphony Orchestra. But back to her symphony, because this is a huge thing. Like this has got to be one of the greatest things ever. Like it's a huge deal. So Chicago Symphony premieres her symphony in E minor on June 15th, 1933 at the Chicago's World Fair. This is huge. Like this is a world renowned orchestra at this time. And so this has been the first symphony to be played by an African-American woman by a professional symphony in America. And actually the, only the second symphony to be played by a woman. The first was Amy Beach. Um, it is a great piece of music and we are now going to take a little bit of listening to it. Um, I love this piece so much. Um, I could listen to this symphony on repeat every day. So good. <laughs> guys I uh, was really tempted to just like stop it right there and you'd be like it's this huge climactic moment and then stop I didn't because it's great um, but I was really tempted <laughs> um, and then I just want to play a little bit of the third movement um, and it's called Juba dance and it's based off of an African-American dance um, so it was brought to South Carolina I think it was by slaves from Congo 
Um, so it was a dance that was done on the plant, like on the plantations, um, sort of as a form of entertainment of something to do. Um, and so how it was done was they would beat rhythms on their bodies, they would clap, um, they would slap, and then it would be like this, um, it would be this, these rhythms that you would dance to. Um, and so um, Florence brought this, this tradition, or not tradition, this, well, yeah, this dance rhythm, this, this sort of thing. Um, she brought it into the third movement here. Here we are. really good music um definitely treat yourself to the rest of that symphony it's so good um so um i i want to just sort of transition to about 1939 um so ethel or florence she also did a lot of um like songwriting and spirituals arranging um and she had one that was really popular it was kind of um, one of her most, it's one of her most well-known, um, very well-performed, it was even recorded. Um, and there's a very um, important performance that happened with contralto, Marian Anderson. Um, a, I, I love contraltos. Anytime someone's a contralto, I'm like, you're my favorite person ever. Um, yeah. Uh, anyway, so, and also she was then the first African-American woman to sing at the Met in 1955, um, the Met's huge. Um, and I'm just gonna give you just a little bit, this is just a really sweet story um, about Marion. So she was really talented as a child, but her family couldn't afford to get her formal training. So the members of the, her church congregation raised funds for her to attend music school. I just, I thought that was so lovely. So anyway, um, it's 1939 and Marion wants to put on a concert. Um, it was at the Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. However, the owner said that there were no dates available. And the real reason was that there was this Daughters of the American Revolution that had this commitment in place that it was only a place for white performers. Well, this caused a huge backlash. People were writing petitions and it got all the way up to Eleanor Roosevelt. So she was not happy about this. So she actually resigned from the Daughters of the American Revolution. And then she went out ahead and got a performance set up for Marion. And so then Marion Anderson played on the steps of Lincoln Memorial. Like that is huge. And this is the same place where Martin Luther King had his famous, I have a dream speech. Like this is a pretty, I mean, that's later, of course, but like, this is a cool place for her to do it. So the concert, was to a crowd of 75,000 people. And then there was more on the radio um, and people were just listening and they were totally into it. Um, and the reason I bring up this concert is because she ended it with Price's arrangement of My Soul's Been Anchored in the Lord. Um, and it's, it's one of her most famous, or her most um, popular, I should say, um, uh, spirituals that she arranged. But um, like, so Price, she really, she really struggled throughout her life. Um, we, we see the things that she's fighting against, um, but she keeps trying um, despite, she was kind of a shy person, I guess, um, but she still tried to get her works promoted. So she uh, wrote a letter to the conductor of the Boston Symphony, Sergei Kusevitsky. Um, and so she sent him a letter with, uh, with one of her scores I um, mean, she mentioned, you know, beforehand, you know, I, I know that I have two things against me. First, I have my gender and then I have my race. But could you please take a look at this? I'll make any amendments that you suggest, um, but just please look at it for, for its musical merit um, and, and tell me what you think. Um, he, he never replied. Um, and the Boston Symphony actually still to this day hasn't played anything by her. Um, but um, she still persevered. She still wrote tons of music. 
Um, so she died uh, June 3rd, 1953. Um, and in 1964, a school was named after her. That's so cool. Who gets a school named after them? That's awesome. And so that's, uh, that's Florence Price. Um, so before I get to the question thing, just because um, I had that little um, tech glitch, uh, I just wanted to mention this one thing that's in the playlist that um, you will just get a crack out of if you listen to it. Um, it's Ethel Smith talking about Brahms. Um, and it's kind of this, some of the stuff you see in the books that she writes in her later years. Um, she started losing her, her hearing in 1913. And by 1930, she was like pretty much deaf. Um, and she did actually write something that year. She, she wrote her final work in 1930. But after that, um, she didn't stop working. She, she took up a career as an author. And in there, she, uh, she tells some portrayals of different people that she meant, like Brahms, uh, Queen Victoria, Sir Thomas Beecham. Um, and anyway, you'll get a huge crack out of her. Um, she's great. Okay, so it is question time. Please give me your questions. I will see what I can do. Ooh, this is beautiful. So we have just a statement of grief. Think of how much the world has lost. Think of what all the women and minorities have ha might have accomplished had they been given a fair shot at education, opportunity, and options. The books not written, the music never played, the cures not found, the inventions not created, the avenues not explored because they were deliberating or deliberately excluded from participating. The loss to the world is heartbreaking. I agree. Thank you. That was Carol Edwards. Um, yeah, I agree. Thank you for that. All right, question. Uh, what were you about to say happened in 1955 with Contralto Marian Anderson? Oh, in 1955, I probably said this way too fast. My apologies. I'm so excited today. Um, she performed at the Metropolitan Opera. Ah, that's huge. The Met. Yes. Any other questions I can answer for you guys today? If not, we can totally play more music. Ooh. Can you recommend a biography of Florence Price? Ooh, okay, very cool. Um, there is a video documentary called The Cage Bird Sings, and it is available through the University of Arkansas. And I was able to stream it on Vimeo, um, like V-I-M-E-A, Vimeo? I'm not saying it right, that thing. Um, it's a really good uh, video documentary. I'm um, finding an actual book on Florence I wasn't able to do here in Saskatoon. We don't have anything like that. Um, but that documentary is really good. Um, yeah. Is there a clip of Marian Anderson singing the piece? Yes, there is. And it is in the uh, playlist. Here, let, let's... Uh, while people type some more questions, let's just play that. Um, there's also Leontine Price in there, and she is another huge um, name in singing. Um, and she also sings it as well. They're both in there. Um, Marian Anderson, here we go.
Ah, beautiful. Ah. Uh, somebody said that they found um, a, a new biography. So 2020 release, uh, Ray Linda Brown ha has The Heart of a Woman, The Life and Music of Florence B. Price. Um, so that is, I will add that to that source list of mine, um, just so if people are looking for books, um, they can find that. Um, I'm gonna just screenshot that. All right. Question. Oh, thanks much. You're welcome, Rebecca. Any other questions? Any other questions? Great to have you all here. Um, yeah, definitely check out the playlist. Um, there's some great stuff in there. Um, yeah, give yourself an hour. Ooh, here we go. I just wanted to mention my student found the music to Fantasy Negra piano solo and performed it for Piano Guild. It was totally awesome to learn about this piece. Cool. Thank you, Nelson. Fantasy Negra, beautiful. She has amazing music. Um, yeah, so good. All right. So yeah, thanks guys. Have a great night. Uh, listen to the playlist, sit back, get some popcorn, some hot chocolate, coffee, whatever you fancy. Um, yeah, and enjoy some music. And I will see you guys next week when we start talking about living composers. All right, guys, have a great night.